how encouraging it is to know that though our sins are many, His mercy is more. Praise God. If you have your Bibles, please turn to 1 John chapter 2, verses, we'll be looking at verses 22 through 26. 1 John chapter 2, verses 22 through 26. We're just continuing to work our way through the book of 1 John, and we see that there are many key things in this book about tests of a living faith, and particularly in this passage, there'll be a warning, a warning to be on the watch, be prepared for deceivers. The Word of God says, who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father. The one who confesses the Son has the Father also. As for you, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. This is the promise which he himself made to us, eternal life. These things I have written to you concerning those who are trying to deceive you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, you have promised us eternal life. Not just eternal existence, you've promised us that for all eternity we will know you in perfect joy and perfect delight. Oh God, we deserve eternal punishment, and yet because of your overwhelming mercy and grace, we get life, life eternal with you. Thank you. Thank you, Christ, for bringing us the gospel. Thank you for opening our blinded eyes so that we could see Christ. Thank you for giving us faith to repent and turn to him as our Savior and Lord. And yet, oh God, there is a great deceiver, Satan, who has blinded so many people so they can't see you, Christ. They can't understand what you did on the cross. Oh Lord, he seeks to infiltrate your church with false teaching. He, He tries to confuse your people, lead unbelievers astray. Oh, we pray that you would protect us, protect us from him. Oh, we ask that we would abide in your word so that we can be protected from his attacks. We can be protected from his deception. Oh, God, strengthen us in your word. Even as we look at this passage today, each person here, every person here, you have a message for each person. I pray that we would hear that message from you, from your word. Open your truth to us. In your precious name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. Liar. Deceiver. These are some of the harshest and strongest accusations that you could make against anyone. Them fighting words. In certain situations, if you would have said those in some eras of history, to, to call someone out as a liar, to call someone out as a deceiver would immediately lead to a, a duel on a field or a shootout on Main Street, and, and someone's going to die from those words that started with liar, deceiver. But that's the level of seriousness that John has when he says at the end of this passage in verse 26, look when he says, these things I've written to you concerning those who are trying to deceive you. John is warning his beloved children of the serious danger of false teachers. And the Spirit of God is warning us through his inspired word of the serious danger of false teachers. This word deceived that he uses in this last verse here, it's a very interesting word. It, it means to, to lead astray. It means to cause to wander. The fundamental meaning is to wander or even to mislead. We get our word planet from this word deceive. You say, well, how does that work? Well, because at that time, the Greeks thought that the planets just kind of wandered randomly through the sky. And so a deceiver is a, a wanderer. It's someone who's wandered away from the truth, and they are trying to draw others into their deception. But as we learned last week, a true believer, a true believer in Christ cannot ultimately be deceived, cannot lose their faith. 
Great encouragement in that. And yet, a deceiver can cause a lot of confusion. A deceiver can cause a, a, lot, of, a lot of doubt and chaos. And a, a, a deceiver can lead astray those who are not true followers of Christ. Even someone who calls himself a, a Christian, if they don't really know the Lord, a deceiver can lead them astray and trap them in false teaching. And so John is, is writing a warning. This passage is a warning that we, that his audience and that we would be prepared to, to stand firm against deceivers. Beloved, are, are you prepared to face a world that is filled with lies? Are you prepared to face a world that is, is filled with deception? Just look around. Actually, don't look around because there's, there's so much lying, so much deception. Are you prepared for that? Or are you easily caught off guard? Are you like a soldier caught out in the middle of the, the battlefield? He has no equipment. He has no bullets for his gun. He's lost all his weapons and he's completely vulnerable. Are you always needing to be rescued or are you able and spiritually strong enough to rescue others? Well, the Spirit of God inspired this passage for each of us to warn you, to warn us, to prepare us for those that are trying to deceive us or trying to deceive our loved ones, that we need to be prepared. We'll see the central theme of this passage is a call for us to be prepared for deception by abiding in God's Word. Be prepared for deception by abiding in God's Word. We'll see two main points. First of all, we'll be called to beware of liars. Beware of liars. And secondly, let the truth abide. First of all, beware of liars. Look at verse 22 of of chapter 2. John says there, Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? Whoa. John starts out right here, and he he calls these people liars, liars. Like a boxer punching his opponent square in the face, John is ferociously attacking these false teachers because he knows how much is at stake here. They were liars. And it's it's been said that to deny Jesus is the Christ is the master lie. To deny Jesus is the lie is the lie par excellence. It's the lie of all lies. Why? Because the greatest lie is to deny the greatest truth. And the greatest truth in all the universe is that Jesus is the Christ. And so to deny that Jesus is the Christ is the greatest lie. What does it mean to deny that Jesus is the Christ? What does that mean? Well, as I've often said, Christ isn't Jesus' last name. No, Christos is a title. It means the anointed one. He's the anointed one. He's the promised anointed one. Christos is a a messianic title that proclaims that Jesus is the promised Messiah. He is the God become man to save fallen sinners. And the false teachers were denying that Jesus was the Son of God become a man. And the Bible teaches that Christ is 100% God, 100% man. And they denied that. Later on in his book, in the last chapter, chapter 4, verses 2 to 3, the Apostle John will say, By this we know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, of which you heard that it is coming, and now it's already in the world. So to deny deny that Jesus Christ, the God of the universe, has come in the flesh, to deny that, to deny that he has become a man, to deny that he is the all-sufficient sacrifice for sinners, that is the greatest lie. That is the greatest lie of the universe. And that is what we would call heresy. Heresy. Now, what's heresy? Heresy is when someone denies the essential biblical truths about the person and work of Jesus Christ. Heresy sentences a person to eternal suffering away from the presence of God. Beloved, the Bible talks a lot about error and false teaching, but all error isn't the same. All error isn't the same. 
Not to be mistaken on the biblical teaching of men and women roles or on the church or a number of other things. End times, is, it's not good, but Scripture won't call you an antichrist for that. Scripture won't call you a liar for that. Scripture won't call you a, a heretic for that. No, those severe terms are reserved for someone who denies the fundamental teaching about the person and work of Jesus Christ. It means that you have rejected the clear teaching about Jesus Christ's person and work for lies. And it means, if a person holds that and is teaching that, it means that they are destined for an eternity of suffering separated from the presence of God. It means that you are leading others in that same eternal destruction. And that's why God's word is very bold and very strong when it calls out this kind of issue. It calls that person a a liar, like John says here. Calls that person a a heretic. Calls that person an an antichrist, we see in the context. And that's why he says, who is the, the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? What does it mean? What does it mean to deny Jesus Christ? What does it mean to deny Jesus Christ? You better know what that means. Because John, the way he talks about it here, it's, it's eternally serious. So we should know, what does it mean to deny Jesus Christ? This word deny means to refuse. It means to, to disregard. It means to dispute. It means to disown. And yet, these people that John is writing about here, these liars and deceivers, they almost certainly would have claimed to believe in Jesus. Almost certainly they would have. They would have pushed back and said, but but John, we aren't denying Jesus. We believe in Jesus. And yet they had subtly and significantly turned away from the full biblical truth about the person and work of Jesus Christ. To refuse to believe any biblical truth about Christ is to deny Christ. Even today, in our society, we are surrounded by people who would say, we don't deny Jesus. We believe in Jesus. In a recent survey, 92% of American adults said they believe that Jesus Christ was a real historical person who actually lived. 56% of American adults in that same survey said that they believe that Jesus was God. 63% of American adults say that they have confessed their sins and accepted Jesus as their Savior. That was amazing. Well over 200 million people in our country would claim to personally believe in Jesus. They would say, no, I don't deny Jesus. And yet there's a disconnect. Look at our society. Look at our world. At the same time as those people that would, so many people that would claim that they believe in Jesus, at the same time, godless wickedness is proliferating at an absolutely exponential rate. How? How do we reconcile that disconnect? How could someone say, well, I believe in Jesus. And yet we see, we see in our society what it is. It's because there are subtle and eternally significant ways to deny Christ. Subtle ways to deny Christ that are eternally significant. You don't have to shake your fist in the air and shout, I don't believe in Jesus, to deny Christ. You don't. That's what John's talking about here. There's a number of ways that people would subtly deny Christ and yet verbally claim to know Christ. One, if, if someone thinks that their good works, the things that they do, in, in any way can add to the finished work of Christ, they are denying Christ. They are saying that, that Christ's death isn't fully sufficient. They're giving their human works more merit than the suffering and death of Christ. They are denying the Christ of the Bible. God's word is very clear. Titus 3, 5 says he saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. 
For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that, so that no one may boast. So if someone says, I, my good deeds are what's going to help me get to heaven, they are denying Christ, even if they would verbally say that they believe in Christ. There's another even more subtle way to deny Christ. If someone refuses to submit to Jesus as Lord and master of their life, they are denying Christ. They, they may say, I, I believe in Jesus. They may even say, I believe that Jesus died for me. But if they're honest, they would say, I don't want to turn away from my sin. I don't want to obey God. I want to be in charge of my life. They sear their conscience by thinking, well, he's a God of mercy. He's a God of love and grace. And since I believe that Jesus died for my sins, I'm okay. They want Jesus as Savior, of course. But they don't want him as Lord. They don't want him as charge of their life. And, and Christ could not have been more clear when he said in John 3, 36, he who believes in the Son has eternal life. And now it's the flip side. He who does not obey. He doesn't say he does not believe. He who does not obey the son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. The apostle Paul put it very clear related to this way of denying Christ in Romans 10, 9, when he says that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus as what? Not just as God, as Lord. That word means master and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So the flip side of that verse is, if you don't do that, if you won't acknowledge Jesus as master, then God's word couldn't be more clear. You are not saved. You are denying Christ. Beloved, no matter how much a person claims to believe in Jesus, if they refuse to submit to him as their loving Lord, that person is denying Christ. He or she has created their own Jesus, and that Jesus is not the Jesus of the Bible. You can't redefine Jesus to fit your preferences, to fit your beliefs, to fit your sin, which tells you what? That the vast majority, the two-thirds of Americans who claim to believe in Jesus, actually, they are denying him with their lives. The vast majority of that number. But why is it serious? Why does John make such a big deal here about denying Christ? Why is it so serious? Look at the, the verses in, in 1 John 2, 22 to 23. He says, who is the liar? But the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ. This is the Antichrist. The one who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father. The one who confesses the Son has the Father also, we saw this last week in the previous passage. The person who denies the true person and work of Christ is called a what? An antichrist. Yes, there is a, a future figure called the antichrist. But those who oppose Christ in this life are denying Christ in this life. They are called little a antichrist. They are opposed. They are opposed to the person and work of Christ. And there are many that are opposed to the person and work of Christ that would say that they know God, that would say that they know Jesus. And this passage tells you that what you believe about Jesus and how you relate to him, the person and work of Christ, defines eternally your relationship with God the Father, eternally. And that's why John says here, whoever denies the Son doesn't have the Father. They were denying the person work of Christ. And they were saying, well, I have a relationship with God. And yet I don't really believe what uh, John or Paul, or the other apostles taught about Jesus. I don't believe that. And yet I have a relationship with God. I, I know God. And John says, no, that's impossible. If you deny in any way the biblical teaching about the person work of Christ, then you do not know God. God is a triunity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. You cannot separate them out. Knowing God the Father and knowing God the Son is absolutely inseparable. Christ said a very, gave an example that's very clearly in John chapter 14. 
John 4, chapter 14, he was talking to his disciples and, and, and Philip, one of his disciples, I, I think he thought he was, Christ would affirm him in this. He said, show us the Father as if, I want to see God the Father as if he would be affirmed in Philip's request. Well, that's a great thing, Philip. You want to know God the Father, but, but Christ's response to him is very significant. Look what he says in, in John 14, 9 to 10. Jesus said to him, and you have to, to sense the emotion, even a level of frustration here. He says, have I been with you so long, and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak of my own initiative, but the Father abiding in me does his works. In other words, you can't have a relationship with God the Father without having a relationship through God the Son. God the Father, God the Son are one, inseparable, in perfect union. The person who denies any aspect of the person and work of Jesus Christ does not know God the Father. Very clear, very clear. What are implications of these first verses here? I think one is that deceptive lies about, the, lies about the person and work of Jesus Christ must be vigorously rejected. Vigorously rejected. If you notice in the, in the New Testament, there's a distinction. There's a distinction in the New Testament between what you're, we are to endure for ourselves and how we are to respond when truth is attacked. There's a distinction between how you respond when you're attacked Versus how you would respond when the gospel is attacked. D. Martin Lloyd-Jones, a 20th century Welsh pastor, said about this quote, With regard to ourselves and our own personal feelings, we are to endure anything and everything. We're not to stand up for ourselves. We're not to call people liars who attack us in person. But where the truth is concerned, where doctrine is involved, where the whole essence of the gospel comes in, and especially the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are to stand and be strong, and we're not to hesitate to use language like this, unquote. There's a distinction. But the problem with us is what? We do the opposite. We respond super strongly when someone does something or says something against us. And yet when the gospel, in some way, the personal work of Christ is attacked, we don't respond strongly. And yet God's word is clear in this example we see with John. When it's a questioning of truth, which is vital for salvation and to the glory of God, there must be no compromise we can't have any misguided attempt to accommodate ourselves to the other person's point of view. Well, let's meet in the middle. There is no middle. There is no middle. The person and work of Christ we must cling to. Now, that doesn't mean we need to be mean. We shouldn't be vindictive. Christ was loving. We need to be gracious. We, could be lo- we must be loving. But it's not loving to not point someone to the error of their ways when they're headed for a Christless eternity. Yes, have a gracious attitude and yet point out if your neighbor, your loved one is living a lie and denying Christ, we need to point out to them that by God's grace, what they are following is a lie. We must help our children, help our loved ones to be able to see the lies that deny Christ. We must stand firm against anything that undercuts the biblical teaching of the person and work of Jesus Christ. This is, this is our faith. This is the center of our faith. This is what it means to be Christians. Christians. Christ is the center of that. And if we deny the true person and work of Christ, we are not truly Christians, true Christ followers. So John is warned here. The first thing, as he calls us to prepare for deception, the first step in preparing for deception is to be aware of Antichrist. Recognize we are surrounded by Antichrist, those that are denying Christ. So how do we prepare? How do we prepare for false teaching? Look at the next verse, verse 24. And that's secondly, we need to abide in the truth. Abide in the truth. John says, as for you, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and the Father. John now, he he tells his readers how they were to stand firm. How they were to stand firm in the shifting sands that surrounded them. He says what they had heard from the beginning. It refers to the preaching of the Christian gospel that God used to bring them to saving faith. 
He's saying you don't need new truth. New truth is old heresy, 100% of the time. New truth is old heresy. He says you don't need that. You need the truth that brought you to Christ. And so we cannot have just a vague affirmation of the gospel. Believer, we must cons- continually consider, meditate on, live in light of the foundational truths of the gospel. That's why as we teach God's word, we often come back to the same things, the person and work of Christ. Rather than look for new or novel truth, we must dwell again and again on the core truths of the Christian faith that are proclaimed by the gospel. That's what saved you, right? And that's what you need to continue to lean into, to grow into. That is where power and strength is to stand against teaching. We don't need new truth. Galatians 1, 8 through 9, Paul warned the uh, believers in the Galatia. He said, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. You don't get any stronger language. He is to be anathema. As we said before, I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you have received, he is to be accursed. What was the strength of their faith? It wasn't in Paul who taught them the gospel. It was in the gospel that saved them. He challenged them, stay with that gospel. And if anyone walks away from that gospel, Paul said, even if I come to you and I have walked away from that true gospel, may I be accursed. Now, that completely goes against our society, doesn't it? The common view of most of our society that clings to the lie that there are many ways to God. There are many ways to God. God's word, Christ couldn't have been more clear. John 14, 6, where Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. It's an amazing passage. It's a fork in the road passage. I, don't, I remember one time I was sharing the gospel with one of our neighbors, and he actually quoted that verse to me. He quoted it, but he quoted it with disdain. He quoted it with anger. He hated it. He hated the truth because he understood what it meant. He says, I can't believe that. I will not believe a religion that says there's only one way to God. And yet, when you look at that verse, when you really understand that verse, it shouldn't make you angry. It should make you in awe. Why? What's the awe? There's a way. There's a way. There's a way that sinners can be reconciled to God. Now, there's only one way, but there is a way. Because without that truth, there is no way that any sinner could be reconciled to God. For sinners who will humbly hear and receive it, there is a way to God through Christ that brings hope and should bring thankfulness and should bring eternal delight. There is a way to God. Praise God. Hallelujah. But there's only one way to God. And that's why John says in that verse, 1 John 2, 24, as for you, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. They needed to let the truth that they had first heard. There wasn't going to be new truth. They needed to let that abide in them, to be at home in them. The the Apostle John is saying that, that in order for you, in order for Christians to be protected from deadly error, God has provided biblical truth that you must live in and grow in. When you think about it, the the people that John was writing to, they they must have been super glad that they got this special letter, 1 John. Well, it wasn't called 1 John. It was just a letter uh, to them from John. But guess what? You have 66 books all collected together that you have access to immediately and easily. The truth, the truth that you hold in your hands is the anchor that will keep your boat from capsizing from the storms of false teaching and error when they assault your soul. But why? Why is it so crucial for you to abide in God's truth? Why must you abide in God's truth? Why must you be at home and abide in God's truth? Look what he says in the verse. He says, as for you, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. Beloved, this passage in John, he's not just concerned that you would have right theoretical doctrine. That's not what this is about. There's far more at stake here. 
He is saying here, if God's truth, if God's truth abides in you, then he says, you will abide in God. What's the flip side of that? If God's truth does not abide in you, you will not abide in God. But if you, if you miss this, if you fail to allow Christ's word to, to abide in you, to be at home in you, if you just kind of have a, a lax approach to the, to the word of God, then you will rarely experience the joy of abiding in God. Joy in God comes from abiding in his word. Now, there's a lot of benefits, a lot of benefits you will get from the word of God. Many benefits, but the deepest benefit is abiding joy in Him. The Bible will lead you. The Bible will lead you to the deepest joy. Why? Because the Bible leads you to God. Leads you to God. It leads you to see Him. It leads you to see Him in His glory. And it leads you to enjoy His fellowship. By abiding, by being home in his word, by letting his word consume you. When I was a boy, I loved to read. I loved to read. I just couldn't get enough of, of reading books about all kinds of stories. And, and even at school, I, I would get in trouble. Because while the teacher was up there teaching, I would actually have a book, a different book about something totally different, uh, propped up in my, my lap so I could read. Well, when you're in the middle of a great story about Robinson Crusoe or, or Gentle Ben or Black Beauty or Treasure Island or, or Prisoner of Zenda, who wants to talk about long division or, or fractions or multiplying decibel numbers? No, no one does. Definitely that fourth grader didn't want to. I was drawn to read, read, read. Why? Because these books would bring great delight because they would transport me into a different world and a different time. All those other kids may have been in that fourth grade classroom, but I wasn't there. I wasn't there. I was transported and I was just super excited about that. I got in trouble sometimes for it too. But brothers and sisters, we have a book. And any other book pales in comparison to, we have a treasure of endless delight because it transports us not just into some theoretical story. No, it transports us into the very presence of God. That's what it means to abide in his word and why abiding in his word is directly connected to abiding in him. Every page, every word in the scripture, it's a window. It's a window into abiding in God. It reveals God to us who is the source of our greatest joy. 19th century English pastor George Mueller said, quote, of this, In what way shall we attain to the settled happiness of soul? How shall we learn to enjoy God? Fair question, should be. How shall we learn to enjoy God? How shall we obtain such an all-sufficient, soul-satisfying portion in Him as shall enable us to let go the things of this world as vain and worthless in comparison? That's a question, isn't it? And then Mueller said, I answer, this happiness is to be obtained through the study of the Holy Scriptures. God has there revealed Himself unto us in the face of Jesus Christ, unquote. That's it. That's it. This is no ordinary book. Scripture is a window into the very presence of God. It's a conduit of endless joy. Endless joy in Him. Psalm 1997 says, Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Now, I was hearing one of our kids just before the service started sitting behind me, and they were quoting that verse, and they actually misquoted it, but I thought it was very interesting. They said, oh, I love your law. It is my medicine all the day. That's true too, isn't it? It's the medicine that you need. You need it. I need it because it points you to God. Is that true in your life? Does God's word abide in you to this degree? Does the word of God consume your thoughts? Does it? Now, to be honest with you, none of us, myself included, have come, to clo have come close to understanding what it means for Christ's words to, to really abide in us, to really to be at home in us. That's why, that's why John says that if God's truth abides in you, then you will abide in God. If you want to draw close to God, it comes to abiding in his word. But that's no temporal or earthly promise. 
Look what he says in verse 25 and 26. He says, John says, this is the promise which he himself made to us. What is his promise? He summarizes in two words, eternal life. These things have I written to you concerning those who are trying to deceive you. Beloved, why is John so concerned? Why is he speaking so strongly? Why is he using such strong language here about those who are trying to deceive him? Why did he take the time and effort to write this letter? Why? Because he knows what's on the line. What's on the line? Eternity is at stake. If you're sitting here and you're reading these words, if you don't have a level of seriousness, you don't understand what he's talking about here. Eternity is at stake. Verse 25, he says, this is the promise which he himself made to us, eternal life. Eternal life. Christ spoke about eternal life in many places, many places. I think one of the best places he spoke about eternal life was in his high priestly prayer in John 17. John 17, 3, Christ defines eternal life. This is the Bible's definition. This is Jesus' definition. What is eternal life? He says, and this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Knowing God is the essence of eternal life. This speaks of, of deep, intimate communion. This is the essence of eternal life. Eternal life is not mere eternal existence. Everyone will exist eternally, but everyone doesn't have eternal life. What relationships in your life bring you the greatest joy? What is it? What are the relationships in your life that bring you the greatest joy? It's, it's probably not the people that you're kind of acquainted with at work. It's probably not the, the grocery store clerk that you see as you buy your groceries. It's, it's probably not your neighbor that you wave to um, as you drive down the street. No, the relationships that bring you the greatest joy and delight are the, those people that you're the closest to, your family, your close friends, people in this room. That's what brings you great joy. That's what brings you great delight. The more intimate and close a relationship, the greater joy and happiness it can bring. The more intimate and closer a relationship is, the more happiness it can bring. But the closest relationship in this life completely pales in comparison to the intimate relationship that you can have and will have with the God of the universe. So why is eternal life a treasure beyond description? Why? It's because eternal life is knowing Christ and God the Father forever in endless joy. Sinners who refuse to believe in Christ as their Lord and Savior will be forever incinerated in the white hot wrath of a holy God. But those that know him, those that have a relationship with him will savor an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ for all eternity. So that's what the gospel is all about. The ultimate good of the gospel is seeing and savoring the beauty and the joy and the light of God in the face of Christ. God's wrath and our sin obstruct that vision, that pleasure. And that's why God is the ultimate gift of the gospel. He doesn't just provide the good news. God doesn't just provide you the good news. God is the good news. God is the good news. All of the delights that are not delights in God must go. Everything else. Not because uh, good must be taken away, but to make room for what is infinitely best, God. Eternal life is the great gift of the gospel. But it only comes the great gift of the gospel when we experience it as knowing and enjoying Jesus Christ and God forever. That's why John is here emphasizing the unshakable promise of eternal life that all God's children have. So what are implications of these last verses? Well, I think the first one is abide in God by abiding in his word. Abide in God by abiding in his word. Your commitment to spending time in God's word is the single greatest factor in your spiritual growth. Your commitment to spending time communing with God in his word is the most, is the most, the single greatest factor in your spiritual growth because it's your single greatest factor in abiding in him. No matter how you spend time in God's word, remember it's a means, not an end. The goal isn't, and it's okay to have charts to keep track of where you're reading, and yet the goal, the goal uh, is not to check off a little box each day and say, oh, I got that done. Uh, I, I feel good about myself because I, I finished that. 
No, the goal is to come face to face with God every day, every day. God's word is a banquet. God's word is a banquet. And he invites you to that banquet every day. And not just to enjoy some food separate, but to enjoy him. He's the banquet. His word is our lifeline to the very presence of God. Now you may say, well, John, that just sounds kind of legalistic. Kind of legalistic to say that I need to meditate on God's word every day. Well, that'd be like saying, it'd be legalistic to say that I need to talk to my lovely wife, Martha, every day. That's just legalistic, John. You need to worry about that. I don't want to be legalistic, so I won't do that. Huh. Well, what kind of marriage would we have? Relationships thrive on communication. You and I need to commune with God in His Word. No, you don't earn brownie points with God by reading the Bible every day. A chapter a day keeps the devil away. No, that's not it. No, but come to His Word to commune with Him, to know Him. Come to His Word hungry, hungry for Him to know him, to find your delight in him. Why does John focus on that here? Because he knows the greatest, the greatest weapon against false teaching is for you to have a deep and abiding relationship with God. Because there will be no attraction to anything else. Because you know God. You know God. You're abiding in his word. You may not know all the details and nuances of what that false teaching is talking about, but you know that you have a relationship with God in his word that is bringing you joy. Not perfect joy. That won't happen until heaven. But you know that you are being satisfied in God. Why would I go anywhere else when God is satisfying me in his word? God's word is a banquet. God's word is a banquet. So we've seen in this passage, we need to prepare for deception by abiding in God's word. Two key ways to do that is beware of liars and let the truth abide. Are you aware? Are you letting the truth abide? During the 1980s and the 1990s, the United States CIA and FBI realized that we had a major espionage problem. Major. There were Russian officials that were actually working for us. They've been providing us critical counterintelligence information on the USSR. They were being arrested and executed at an alarming rate. So we knew that we had a traitor. We had a deceiver. We had a betrayer within our own ranks. And after an extensive investigation, took actually a number of years, on February 18, 2001, Robert Henson was arrested after over two decades, two decades of selling the most sensitive of secret information. At the time of his arrest, uh, Henson was a 25-year CIA veteran. He had sold top secret information of over $1.4 million. He had sold thousands and thousands of classified documents to the KGB that included our, our, our nuclear strategies, included our military weapon technologies, included what we would do during a time of war, even included our counterintelligence program. Hansen's activities were called at one time possibly the worst intelligence disaster in United States history. And really the, probably the most tragic part of that is hundreds of Hundreds of our spies were betrayed, and a number of them were executed because of Hansen's deception. There's a reason that gov our government is on a careful lookout for spies, and look out for deceivers that can cause tremendous damage to national security, but eternally more significant is that we have a great deceiver, Satan himself, that is behind a far more insidious deception and lying than any earthly government. He is a great deceiver. He has a host of minions that are doing everything possible to distort the true gospel, not just to kill someone in this life, but so that they would be sentenced to an eternity of suffering apart from the presence of God. But if you're a Christian, if you're a true follower of Christ, you need not fear him. You need not fear him. Why? Because God has provided his powerful word so that you can be immersed in the truth. Not just truth in what to believe, but truth about God so that you can grow more and more and you can abide in him and know him. Beloved, do you realize what is at stake in what John has just taught in this passage? What's at stake here? Eternity. Eternity is at stake in this passage. This passage is a fork in the road. And for every person here, this passage is a fork in the road. For some here, for some here, the promise in that last verse there, Christ's promise is not eternal life to you. 
His promise is not eternal life. His promise to you is eternal death. Suffering fiery torment forever and ever away from God's presence. Why? Because you're denying Christ. You say, how can I be denying Christ? I'm here. I'm in a church. I'm in a church. Come on. I've come here in a church. I would, pub- I would acknowledge Jesus is Christ. I would even say that Jesus Christ died for my sins. You may claim Jesus as your Savior, but you must admit, some here, you're refusing to submit to him as your Lord. You want to be in charge of your life. The call of this passage for you is so serious. It's a call for you to repent of your sin, to turn from your sin, to believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, and to submit to him as your Lord, to submit to him as your master. Kids, this is particularly important for you. Young people growing up in a, in a Christian home, you know all the facts. You know you'll give Jesus the answer to pretty much every question. You know who Jesus is. You know what he's done for you. And yet, you need to come to the place. Kids, young people, you need to come to the place where you come to Christ as your Savior. I believe he died on the cross for your sins, but also as your Lord. That he, he, he calls you to follow him. For each person here. You must come to Christ as your Savior and Lord. Don't try to clean up your life. Why? Because you've already passed the point of cleaning it up enough. Because you can't clean it up enough. You have to be perfect. He doesn't expect perfection because he provided perfection. The issue is direction, not perfection. Come to Christ as your loving Lord. Come to Christ as your gracious Savior who has provided a way for you to be reconciled to him. And if you do know Christ as your Savior and Lord, which is the vast majority who are here, then you need to cultivate a a more vivid awareness of the promise of eternal life. A more vivid awareness that you would value things in this life on an eternal scale. That eternal values determine what's really important in your life. Let every disappointment, every struggle, every difficulty be completely overshadowed by the sure and certain promise of eternal life. But also let every joy, let every joy, let every blessing Every earthly happiness that God has given to you, let every one of those be a reminder of the glorious reality of the God of the universe who has promised you eternal, indescribable joy in his presence forever and ever. And then you lean into his presence now by abiding in his word and abiding in him. So beloved, the call of this passage is for you to prepare for deception by abiding in God's word and abiding in God. Let's pray. Go ahead and talk to the Lord. Are you abiding in his word? Are you abiding in Christ? Oh, Lord, it overwhelms us that you have provided a way. It's a very narrow way. It's only through you, Christ. And yet, you have provided a way for sinners to be reconciled to you. I pray that we would be overwhelmed by that. And that would draw us into your presence, to abide in your presence, to abide in your word. So that that would be the the greatest defense against false teaching. Because we know you. We know your Father. And through your Spirit's power, we are living in communion with you. Oh, Lord, thank you that we can know you. In your precious name we pray. Amen.